Hi, and welcome to part two of our double episode on an introduction to the Spanish Civil War and Revolution. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'd go back and listen to that first. About a week after the start of the Spanish Civil War, around two-thirds of the Spain was in the hands of the Republican government or the revolutionary working class and peasantry, with the other third in the hands of the rebel nationalist military. But its ramifications spread far beyond Spain's borders. The international dimension of the Civil War and Revolution was very complex. We are going to have more episodes in future looking at different aspects of this, but for now we ask Nick Lloyd, author of Forgotten Places, Barcelona and the Spanish Civil War, to give a brief overview. As a content note, this episode contains mention of sexual violence. As the war develops very quickly, the Republic is def- n- needs weapons, and it first turns to the Western democracies, who say no. And because of that, the Republic is desperate. You know, you can get arms, a few machine guns and stuff on the illegally on the market, Czechoslovakia, whatever. But it, it really does need big weapons, and the Western democracies have said no, so where else can they turn? And they turn to the Soviet Union, the second option, and they ship in the the autumn of 36, the Republic, not the Communist Party, as is sometimes reported, 70% of its gold reserves to the Soviet Union, which was actually the fourth largest gold reserve in the world at the time. And as I say, Stalin did send them some very good stuff, very good planes, the best the Soviets had, not as good as the Germans, but they were the best they had. And what was possibly the best tank in the world at the time, the T-26, which starts to arrive in the autumn of 36 and probably saves the Republic in late 36. It certainly saves Madrid, and if they'd lost Madrid, that would have been it. And of course, gives the Communist Party a huge role in affairs of the Republic they never would have had allows them to dictate military strategy, boom in numbers, and this is a role, as, for example, George Orwell reminded us, became a bit murderous, and the Republic looked through the way because it needed Moscow's, needed Moscow's weapons. I'm sure that most listeners will have heard of George Orwell, but just in case, he was a British author and socialist who travelled to Spain with his wife, Eileen O'Shaughnessy, to fight against the fascists, and later got shot in the neck for his troubles. He wrote a journalistic account of his experiences in his book, Homage to Catalonia. The Soviets sent 1,900 military staff, uh, almost all clandestinely on Mexican passports. In contrast, 1,900, the Italians, sending aid to Franco, 78,000, Mussolini, which not far off bankrupted the Italian state and severely undermined his ability to wage the Second World War because, you know, Mussolini's aid was absolutely ideologically driven. Now, Germany's role was slightly more ambiguous in that it was also to make money and much more calculating geopolitically as well, I think. The so-called Condor Legion, 19,000 technicians, so-called technicians rather, including large numbers of tank drivers and pilots. The Condor Legion was organized ultimately by Goering, and Goering had a very high turnover of staff in Spain. Why? Well, he admitted at Nuremberg before he shot himself or poisoned himself, right? he wanted as many Nazis as possible to get experience in dropping bombs on humans. If you like, the conclusion would be that the Spanish Civil War, as much as being decided in the terrible battles of Spain, was also decided in London, Paris, Moscow, Rome and Berlin. While the Western democracies, principally France and Britain, were nominally in favour of non-intervention in Spain, effectively that meant tacit support for Franco's forces, as they stopped sales of weapons and equipment to the Republic, while Italy and Germany were blatantly flouting the non-intervention agreement that they signed. That said, the Popular Front government of French socialist Leon Blum did secretly provide some aircraft and pilots to the Republic. The United States also claimed to be neutral, although American corporations like Texaco supported the nationalists. For example, the oil company Texaco had a contract to supply the Republic with oil, but as soon as the coup took place, 
Texaco immediately sent a tanker to Franco. They then cut off supplies to the Republic, agreed to give Franco all the oil that he needed, despite the Nationalists at the time not having any money to pay for it. Texaco also gave information on shipping to the Nationalists, who used it to capture or sink ships supplying the Republic. Now, because of non-intervention, shipping oil to Franco was illegal, as was giving credit to a faction in a war, but in the end, Franklin Roosevelt's government just gave Texaco a small fine. Mexico was actually the first government to declare support for the Republic, and did give it financial aid, as well as some small arms and a few aircraft. They were the most important elements of the response from different governments around the world. The international working class also responded to the outbreak of the war and revolution. So as the war begins, more and more workers from around Europe and even further afield are taking the defence of the Spanish Republic and the revolution, the social revolution, which is engendered by the failure of the coup as their cause. We have to also think there were also a considerable number of refugees, political refugees in Spain anyway, from Argentina, Portugal, Italy and Germany. And they are some of the first foreigners fight against fascism right at the start of the war, specifically a group of Germans form the core, there are a bunch of Germans living in Barcelona, and they form the core for what becomes the international brigades. As the weeks go on, in the summer of 36, more and more foreign volunteers are appearing in Barcelona, and the Communist Party realise they have to do something about this, because you, the Stalin's initial reaction is to keep out of things. He doesn't want to antagonise the Western democracies, he's playing this long game, he's obsessed with his own defence of all, and he kind of doesn't really want to get involved in Spain um, initially. But he's, he's basically told by people below him, Italian Communist Party, for example, that they have to take advantage, they, they have to be seen to be helping in this international workers' movement. And so at some point in the end of September, they come up with the idea, the actual initial idea, no one's actually sure exactly how it happens, but the International Brigade is formed. A remarkable achievement, which brought... Well, the, the estimate is it's about 40,000 foreign volunteers fought in Spain, of which perhaps 35,000 were the International Brigade. And... They come from really all over the world, but there were about a thousand, more than a thousand Cubans. Um, there were seven, seven or eight hundred Arabs, something which is almost always forgotten, anti-colonial Arabs who fought together in Spain with the Jewish comrades. More than 20% of the brigaders were Jewish, 80% were working class, so it's kind of the old, one of the older myths, perhaps not so much now, but in the old days, but all the, you know, a lot of them were young, romantic intellectuals were a very small percentage of young romantic intellectuals. They just wrote, they were the ones that wrote about it or had been wrote about them. The vast majority were working class. And at the beginning of the war, they played a very important role militarily in the defense of Madrid and the battle of perhaps Jarama or so. And as the war goes on though, and that gave, that was a huge input of morale. You know, the Spanish, the Spanish are seeing that foreign workers are coming from in solidarity, they had to give up their lives for their cause, and this really engenders on the Republican side a great feeling of internationalism, that, you know, that we're not alone, the, the government and the states have, have, um, have abandoned us, but the working class hasn't. Yeah. Um, as the war goes on, the international brigades suffer terrible casualties, 10,000 died. I mean, they used this cannon powder, really. And as the war goes on, the international brigades, each um, division, get there's not enough foreign volunteers arriving and the foreign governments are making it harder and harder for people to come. And so they have to make work with Spanish volunteers. So n nearer the end, you know, perhaps half the international brigades were actually Spanish. I'm not sure what the figure is. And by the end, by the farewell of the brigaders in October 38, 
in a sense, they're a spent force. I mean, the Republic is not really, it's right near the end, lacking men. It's lacking good weapons and good logistics and, and, and petrol. And something that's worth, also worth saying is there is a huge, mainly working class, support for the Republic back in their own countries. A few US cities, but above all France, the France of the Popular Front, Scandinavia, Sweden, Norway, and the UK. And I mean, to this day, it's still the biggest aid effort in Swedish history. And we're not talking about the Swedish government being involved. We're talking about workers, working class organisations. As we spoke about in part one, Spain was a deeply divided society in 1936. There were also deep and fundamental divisions within the Republic itself, which erupted in May 1937 in what some have described as a civil war within a civil war. After two months, as the needs of winning, winning the war seemed to become apparent, the pro-Republican parties, which is the Liberal Republican Socialists and the Communist Party managed to convince the revolutionary groups, the PUM and above all the CNT, to join a new government. And if they don't, they won't get weapons for their militias. And at the end of September 1936, for the first, and I guess not for half the only time in world history, or almost, anarchists join a government, which is a bit of an oxymoron, but it's what happens. And and of course, one of the greatest divisions, complexes of divisions on the left, we could like those in favor of the Republic, those in favor of the Revolution, but actually one of the biggest divisions of all was actually within the anarchists themselves as well, those in favor of who were the majority of working at some level with the Republican government during the war, and those who in favor of an out and out revolution who were probably the minority. The anarchists joined the government, first the Catalan government, and a week or so later, at the end of September 36, and a week or so later, the Spanish government. And they take national ministries, four anarchist ministers joined the Spanish government. This leads to the collectives being legalized, more or less, and the revolution, some level, being legalized in Catalonia. But it creates more and more tensions because it's political limbo. Who's in power? Who's got control over the armed forces, the police, and the weapons, and, and the money? The situation in the autumn is relatively calm, but by January the tensions are really rising. These tensions would have existed anyway, and a lot of them go back to pre-struggles in the labour movement between the anarchist CNT and the socialist UGT, which at times were quite violent pre-war, but they're also amplified by the Soviet um, pressure on the Republican government to end with the poo. So you've got internal struggles on the left, which go back a long way, and you've got an outside thing of Stalin's obsession with destroying all forms of Marxist opposition. And this leads to a slander campaign from about January 37, uh, maybe before that, against the Poom, insinuating that they might be fascist even. These tensions are rising. There are murders on between all the groups in March and April 37. And then this, these political tensions are just not going to last, and the bubble, they're not going to last in this day of war. And then finally, impacts inevitably explode in the terrible infighting, which are called in English the May Days or the May Event. The spark of this is when the police, who are now more or less in communist control, tried to take the telephone exchange, which was controlled by the anarchist CNT. And the workers there resist, and the city is an accident waiting to happen. Now, why did the police do that? Were they under Soviet instructions to provoke a reaction on the workers, which would lead to the repression of the workers, which would allow them to push the revolution and destroy the poom? Or was it the Spanish Republican or Catalan, or Catalan government who just wanted to re-control, take control of communications from a working class organisation? I suspect it's more the latter, but 
the Communist Party certainly take advantage of the events. So whether or not they actually provoke the events is a debate, but they certainly knew how to take advantage of them. The workers there resist, and the city is an accident waiting to happen. Two sides chaotically emerge on the map. Well, on the one side, we have the mass of the anarchist factory workers and the POOM. And on the other side, we have Catalan nationalists, the Communist Party and the police. And although I think something like 400 people were killed in the terrible infighting on the left in the streets of Barcelona in four or five days, I think it's also worth saying that probably the vast majority in any of the groups didn't want to be involved. We just did not know how to stop it. You know, it was just something that no one knew how to stop. And after five days, the fighting kind of stops. A compromise appears to be reached. But very soon it becomes clear that it wasn't a compromise, that the Republican government and the Republican parties have won over the revolutionary parties. And the CNC has been completely outnumbered. It has made, made massive concessions over the previous months and been politically outnumbered. And the Republican government is now firmly back in control and starts to break up not all, but many of the collectives, either in small numbers return, returning them to their owners, more often than not nationalising them, if they were a war industry. Not, not all the collectives were broken. I mean, for example, transport. The trams were collecting rights throughout the war, for example. And the Republican government, you know, is now firmly back in control and able to concentrate on rebuilding its army and state to fight the war. The Republican government has two strategies. One, it wants to end the social revolution because it's not an anarchist government. It's a socialist, probably democratic socialist government. So, of course, it's in its interest to destroy the collectives. And two, it's doing so because it, it sees it's the only way you can win the war by having a centralised war effort. Now, the Communist Party is similar in a way. It also sees that the only way they can win the war is through a centralised war effort. It is also not interested in a social revolution in Spain because Stalin's objective at that moment is an agreement with Britain and France, and he doesn't want to antagonise Britain and France. And the Communist Party now have a lot more power. They don't take over the government. It is a plural government. I mean, to give you an idea, the anarchists were kicked out, but six months later they were back in. It's the C and T were the real victims, and the small section of the anarchist movement who was absolutely against any form of collaboration with the government. So the Communist Party don't take over the government, but they have a lot more power now, and they express that through the illegal prisons where awful things do happen. The latest studies indicate two or three dozen were directly murdered by the NKVD in Spain, not thousands. It, we, more than anything else, we're talking about the long shadow of Stalin, who's, who's got his own aims in Spain, not to take over the government, but to crush dissident Marxism, and at the same time, keep as possible an agreement with Britain and France, which of course in the end failed. And the Republican government looks the other way, it's, it, it knows what's happening, but it looks the way because it needs weapons and nobody else will sell them. But also, there's a very strong thing, is they don't want to antagonise the Western democracies. They're trying to ways of saying, look, we're not revolutionary. Uh, we have our own house in order. Please sell us weapons. The NKVD Nick mentioned there was the Russian secret police. We know it was a confusing set of events. So just to try to summarise for clarity or any listeners who weren't quite able to keep up with the different acronyms. Within the Republic, there emerged essentially two broad factions, the revolutionary movement, which included anarchists and the POM, and on the other side, the Republican government, which included liberals, Catalan nationalists and the Communist Party. The anarchists saw the revolution and the fight against fascism as being one and the same thing and thought that the fascists could ultimately only be defeated by a revolutionary movement of workers and peasants and the abolition of capitalism. They thought that without this prospect of completely transforming the lives of ordinary people, a straightforward fight between two different capitalist governments wouldn't be enough to motivate people to risk their lives. On the other hand, the government and the Communist Party believed that a centralised and top-down nationalist army could only be beaten by a centralised and top-down republican army. 
and they also feared that a revolution would scare off Spain's potential democratic allies like Britain and France. So they wanted to stop the revolution and have a straightforward military conflict between the respectable, democratically elected capitalist republic on the one hand, and the military rebels on the other. Going back to the civil war itself, after the republic and the working class had successfully suppressed a military rising in most of the country in the first few days of the revolution, from that point on they were mostly waging a defensive battle, best summed up by the slogan coined by Basque communist leader Dolores Ibururi, who was known as La Passionaria. That slogan was no passeran, they shall not pass. As an interesting side note, that same slogan was adopted by East London residents in the October of 1936, who were determined to stop fascist aristocrat Oswald Mosley marching his black shirts through the heavily Jewish working class area. Learn more about that in our podcast episode 35. The Civil War lasted for nearly three years, and far too much happened to go through it all here. So we asked Nick to briefly summarise the key battles. So after one week, we had a territorial division, and then slowly Franco's forces encroached on Republican territory for a series of offensives. First of all, they sweep up from the south, through militias, within three months they're sieging the city of Madrid, and then there's an encirclement of Madrid, and there's also uh, slowly in the north in 1937, Cantabria, Asturias, and the Basque Country, all one by one fall. And then we have two of the great, the, the, the worst battles of all, which were Teruel in the winter of 37 38 in Aragon, uh, fought under really awful conditions in blizzards. The temperatures dropped to minus 18. As the international press talks about this Siberian war. Um, which the Republic appears to take, what well, the Republic successfully takes there well, and it appears that it's, it's a fighting force again, but it's a Pyrrhic victory, and then Franco's troops retake there well, and split Republican territory in two um, by early 38, spring of 38, and that leads us to the Battle of the Ebro, which is the Republic's last roll of the dice in the summer of 38, the biggest battle in Spanish history, and now we can say the back of the Republican army is broken, and Franco launched his final attack on Catalonia in uh, December 38, and that leads us to the fall of Barcelona on the 26th of January 1939, and Catalonia falls in early February 39, and then all that's left, we got still quite a sizable rump of about a third of Spain, Madrid and to the southeast, that finally capitulates on the last day of the war in April, the 1st of April 1939, and that's the end of the war. For the Republic, the war was essentially a defensive battle, and a heroic one at that, facing a much better supplied better armed and more experienced enemy. But it was also, with a couple of notable exceptions like the Battle of Guadalajara, a succession of defeats. So in retrospect, is it possible to tell who was right in terms of their strategy? Was it the anarchists who thought that only the revolution could defeat the fascists? Or was it the Republican government who thought that only a centralised force with military discipline could? Well, certainly it was true that the primary strategic victories for the Republic were just in the first few days of the conflict, when it was the armed working class who successfully suppressed the military rising. But military historian Anthony Beaver points out in his excellent book, Battle for Spain, that they bore a heavy cost for these victories. Many of the anarchist fighters in particular were so fanatical in their beliefs, they essentially sacrificed themselves unnecessarily. So for example, in one instance, after having surrounded a rebel military barracks, Rather than simply waiting until those inside were forced to surrender, they attacked en masse and did successfully overrun it, but suffered huge losses, including many leading organisers. In the period of conventional warfare, the revolutionary militias were starved of arms and ammunition, and so couldn't be expected to perform particularly well. But after the government militarised the militias, i.e. turned them into a regular standing army, they didn't fare much better. And worse, without the internal democracy they had before, they were subjected to the whims of politicians, who ordered numerous offensives for propaganda reasons to try to improve morale, which failed spectacularly. 
Either way, whichever strategy you sympathise more with, the war ended in victory for the nationalists. 5th of March 1939, the Republican government makes the decision to flee into exile. And by the 28th of March, officially now the Republican army is disbanded and surrenders. With Franco entering Madrid on the 28th of March 1939, as his image of himself, this figure of El Cid or the Archangel Michael of Spain, the saviour of Spain, he duly organises a victory parade in Madrid. He's flanked by Africanistas on white horses. He's driven in in a convertible car into the city, into the capital. But just as like Barcelona that fell in January of 1939, when Madrid fell in March 1939, it's those that would have resisted beforehand are dead, they're in exile, or they're exhausted, they're defeated already, and they're in hiding. 1st of April 1939, Franco's officially established as El Caudillo, the great general Francisco Franco of Spain, and recognised by several countries such as Portugal, Ireland and the USA. Alongside the military aspect of the conflict, there were also mass killings behind the lines. These are known as the White Terror on the Nationalist side, while on the Republican side, they're known as the Red Terror. On the side of the left, the estimate is 50,000 people were killed, murdered, behind the lines in revolutionary violence. It happened in what was already a really violent society, particularly in the South. After decades of terrible grievances and Republic, it's like a pressure cover exposed because of the coup and all hell breaks loose. Who commit the violence? Well, Catalonia, for example, the violence is mainly at the anarchists. So rather than being one ideological group or another, it's sections of society. In Barcelona City, it's about 1,300 almost all in the first eight weeks, ten weeks. In addition to the clergy and the military, one of the biggest groups of victims here, probably the biggest group, were gangsters in local neighbourhoods, loan sharks, pimps, and above all, what were called the syndicates euros, which were equivalent, say, to the Pinkertons in the United States, the strike breakers, back in the 20s, the memory of this was very strong, and they were massacred, and I think it's half those who were murdered in Barcelona had been members of these syndicates. Of course, many instant people are killed. People are killed just for being right wing, Catholic, rich. A lot of the violence is committed by petty criminal elements. You've often said one of the biggest mistakes anarchists made is to release everyone from the prisons. They had a failed VQ in Barcelona. They stormed what they saw as Barcelona's Bastille, La Modelo prison. Not like in Bastille, where there were a handful of prisoners. There were thousands there, and they took out all the militants, but they also released a large number of common murderers and criminals who jump on the bandwagon and they're killing for private profit, score cycling, etc. You know, you can walk down the Ramblers, pick up a CNT armband, shove it on and give in the CNT and you didn't need much more than that. Some of the anarchists did try to stop this and shot people for it even in Barcelona, but others, we could say, perhaps looked the other way, said it was the will of the people and others still, and you really do not need many individuals at all to create an immense amount of harm or directly, murderously involved in eliminating their so-called enemies. Whatever the case, by the end of September, a combination of A, the newly reformed Republican government, and B, many, many of the more moderate anarchists who by now are extremely shocked by what was happening in Barcelona, uh, managed to stop the violence, both legally but also socially on the streets. Due process, habeas corpus are restored. It may take too long, of course, but it happens in a social context and is stopped and condemned. And I think it's an important point to make that we know it's 50,000, 100 up, 100 down on the Republican side, because not only does the Franco regime investigate this when they win the war for what was called the Causa General, general cause, so did the Republic. The Republic investigated judicially the violence on its own side, which I think we could say is a clear moral difference. Some of the most enduring images of the war are of people posing with the corpses of nuns. These are often interpreted as evidence of mass Republican killings of nuns, but that's not exactly true. Well, firstly, it's not entirely accurate to describe the individuals pictured as Republicans. And secondly, the images don't depict nuns who had been murdered. 
Anti-clericalism in Spain predates the Spanish Civil War and predates the Second Republic. That's not to say that the Republic supported the Catholic Church as an institution. The Republic and those who identified as Republicans were openly critical of the Church's reactionary position and saw it as a fundamentally corrupt institution. But when the Spanish Civil War breaks out, there's no particular union, political party or political figure which organises the violence against the Catholic Church. Instead, it's very much a class-based anger. It's an outrage mainly felt by workers and peasants who are anti-Francoists but not necessarily Republicans. The intensity of anti-clericalism had been building up for over a century before the Spanish Civil War in both urban and rural parts of Spain. The Spanish Inquisition had only ended in 1834. The Catholic Church was an institution in many ways still stuck in medieval times. It was still using the language of the Inquisition. The Church served the interests of the powerful and rich in Spain while keeping the poor classes in moral servitude. There was never a reformation in Spain and the Catholic Church still maintained that if you accepted the life you were born into, and you worked hard and prayed harder, you'd get your rewards, when in heaven. For some, essentially the institution was using the pulpits to justify socioeconomic divides in the country, intellectually justifying class division. Before the Second Republic was declared in 1931, the church had a role of providing health and education for the poorer classes in Spain. However, hospital care at times was denied to those who refused to profess their faith in Catholicism. Education was described as being indoctrination and it's known that there was hardly any spaces in schools available for workers and peasants and their children. We have this tangible build-up of anger over quite some time before the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. But what tops this release is the church is siding with Franco and his supposed crusade he started in the country at the beginning of the war. It was yet another sign of where the institution's interest laid. With the outbreak of the war comes another wave of anti-clericalism but this time the workers and peasants have some access to arms. And at the start of the conflict, a murder streak emerges like never seen before in the anti-clericalism. When we see images of desecration of corpses from the Spanish Civil War, these tend to be bodies that were disinterred and taken out to the streets, streets from the crypts in churches. Yes, there were murders. A total of almost 7,000 members of the clergy were killed of which 300 almost were nuns. They're horrific numbers, but most of the murders didn't happen in public places. Instead, nuns or priests were kidnapped, taken outside of towns and villages, up to the hills, ridiculed and then killed. The images you see of dead clergy, the nuns in particular, is actually post-mortem desecration. They were bodies in a state of decay, bodies that were buried in the crypts of churches. This interment and display of dead bodies had happened frequently pre-civil war. It had become this really grotesque way of challenging the power of the church and exposing the mystery and occult forces of Catholicism as powerless. During the Spanish Civil War in Barcelona, disinterred bodies were placed out in the streets. Workers were invited to come and gawk at them and some were noted for shouting, look, they're flesh and blood, just like me and you. Perhaps it was a way of exposing the hypocrisy of the church's divine right and insulting the public presence of Catholicism. Images of the nuns' corpses are particularly shocking The bodies are in a state of decay, but you can see the nuns' habits in good condition. They are immediately recognisable as members of the church. Traditionally, of course, this image of piety associated with nuns, the incorruptible figure, it's challenged here. However, this did work perfectly for Franco, to legitimise his crusade, to abhor people with the atrocities carried out by the anti-Franco side of the war, and to rid Spain of what he would deem this anti-clerical violence as red terror. While the Catholic Church beatified priests killed by Republicans as martyrs, it remained silent about those killed by Franco's forces. For example, at least 14 Basque Catholic priests were killed by the Nationalists in the White Terror, which in total had far more victims than the Red. On Franco's side, it's rather different. In this case, it's a numbers game. No one knows. I mean, there's all estimates. It's 120,000, 180,000. No one really knows, or more. Um, From day one, it's state-sanctioned terror. Um, General Moller, who's the initial director of the coup, he said on the first day, we must sow terror, we must create a sensation of horror, we must eliminate, without scruples, all those who do not think like us. It's accompanied by mass rape, mass torture. These are tactics that just do not exist on the Republican or revolutionary side. I'm not saying things didn't happen, of course they did, but it was never systematic. 
and this is a, a very marked difference is the treatment of women on the Republican side and how leftist women were treated on Franco's side. Uh, they go out to village after village, you know, who's voted for the left, who's an electoral official, who's the teacher in those new schools against the wall. Franco said, in fact, to a journalist from the New York Times, I'll shoot half a Spain if I have to, to paraphrase. After the war, 50,000 50, more died of use in Spain's prisons, concentration camps, probably doubled or tripled those cities if it hadn't been the exile. 200,000 died of starvation as a direct result of the war and food aid to Nazi Germany. Millions of lives ruined on both sides. Families ripped asunder by war, ideology and exile. Many people were forced to flee what would be certain death. Half a million anti-fascist refugees travelled mostly on foot across the Pyrenees to seek refuge in France. There, many of them were interned in concentration camps in often appalling conditions where large numbers died. On following the Nazi takeover of France, many of these camps were simply taken over by the Germans and run even more callously and brutally. Mexico also took around 20,000 refugees who were considered to be of the right, quote, race and, quote, blood. But to be admitted to Mexico, refugees had to demonstrate that they could pay their own way and to agree that they'd stay out of Mexican politics. Passage to Mexico was also mostly organised by former government officials, so it was harder for anarchist and poom refugees to get asylum than it was to those who had connections with the Republican government or the Communist Party. The Dominican Republic also welcomed numerous Republican refugees. For those who couldn't get out, they had to try to survive in a very different Spain. After the war, when Franco wins, you can tell the wins and the losers by the way people walk, the defeated are stooped, Marked out, marked out as being scum, barbarians, not even allowed to dignify their own dead. And Spain becomes a state of fear. There's a huge number of people in Franco's penitentiary universe, concentration camps and prisons, work camps, where abuse is absolutely systematic, slave labourers, building roads, which we drive on today, the cars, dams, which our water comes from today. In the 1940s, the Franco regime goes to extremely murderous phase, and the control of the population was absolute for anyone who'd lost the war. Torture is absolutely systematic if you're involved politically. They just have to learn some lessons here. For Republican women, the situation was even worse. After the war, the women undergo a double defeat. One for their ideas, be they liberal or revolutionary, and two, quite simply, the condition of being women. They're kicked back into the Middle Ages. At the very least, they become the property of their husbands, as do right-wing women. But those who lose the war, they often go for terrible sexual violence or having their heads shaven, which is one thing that happened in a mass level in villages, was priests in the square on saints' days forcing the Republican women uh, to drink castor oil, which is a purgative which makes them shit and vomit, basically. And then they would be jeered after they were paraded around the square. And they have to maintain somehow their families in a state of hunger, in a state marked out as being red women or, or the wives of red women, and many of those men are either in exile or they're dead or they've got one leg or they're in a concentration camp or prison and and somehow manage to maintain you know the people around them and awful, awful time. Francoist authorities also increased repression of LGBTQ people, locking up gay men and lesbians in prisons and mental institutions. Lucia Sanchez Sauernil, who we mentioned briefly in part one, survived the war and fled to France with her partner, America Barroso, although later they were able to return to Spain and live under the radar until Lucia's death in 1970. We hope to produce an episode about queer resistance to Franco at a later date. For Catherine, there are a lot of parallels between attitudes towards Spanish refugees after the war and those towards Syrian and Central American refugees today, 
especially given the recent resurgence of right-wing populist and fascist movements? Franco never called himself a fascist, and, and that's probably one of the most challenging questions I have on tour is what is fascism? And genuinely now, I think the best answer I can give is it's, it's not what it says it is. You don't have to be a fascist to be a fascist, but fascism is what it does, not what it says it is. So when you look at these patterns of Francisco Franco, when you look at the language nowadays used by some political leaders, they're not calling themselves fascists, but they're rhetoric. Not in any way dissimilar to what we look back in hindsight now in a prison to the 1930s and say, oh, whoa, that can never happen again. Just two years ago, Nick managed to find online a newspaper from France called uh, Illustration. And towards the back of the newspaper, it's documenting the refugee crisis at the French border of the Spanish in exile. And there's these horrible photos. And you see one of a, a grown man with what we know now is his daughter. And it's the Garcia family. And she's missing a leg that was lost during the war. And then you look at the photo and behind them, you see another man holding the hand of a child. And both those people have their legs missing. And then you say to the group, you know, they've just walked over the Pyrenees in the winter months with one leg. They get to the border of France and the French government at the time, under Deladier, does not want to let these people into the country. And I'm like, look at the caption of what it says in this magazine. And there's a small caption at the end of that photo that says the undesirable convoy. I mean, I almost expect every time I show those photos and then I say, look at the French caption, look at look, the editor of the magazine. They've captured it as undesirables. And every time I have someone from the United States or even Europe, it comes out, you know, that's not in any way dissimilar to the language that's being used today. Despite the terrible treatment of Spanish anti-fascist refugees, after the Nazi occupation of France, many of them became the best fighters in the French resistance maquis. For example, in 1944 at Le Madeleine, a unit of 32 Spanish and eight French resistance fighters defeated an entire German column of 1,300 men. And when Paris was finally liberated, it was the half-track vehicles of the ninth column, made up of Spanish Republican fighters, which was the first to enter the city. After World War II ended, which was pretty much billed in the West as a war of democracy against fascism, many Spanish Republicans expected Franco to be toppled after his allies of Mussolini and Hitler. But sadly, they had to learn that the so-called democracies had no problem with fascism per se, they just didn't want any expansionist foreign powers interfering with their own interests. With this realisation, that only the working class and poor population of Spain could defeat Franco, many fighters returned to the country to join the underground guerrilla resistance, which would fight on against insurmountable odds for many years. That concludes our overview of the Spanish Civil War and Revolution. Now we're going to say a little about where you can find out more and give some more info about Nick and Catherine's work. So firstly, for a different overview of the conflict, I appeared on the Revolutionary Left radio podcast to give a brief history, uh, which they combined with testimony from participants. You can listen to that through our link in the show notes. We've got episodes in the pipeline on international volunteers in the Civil War. Did any members of your family volunteer? If so, please get in touch and let us know. Drop us a line on info at workingclasshistory.com. We also plan on making episodes about Spanish fighters in the French resistance and the guerrilla resistance to Franco. So make sure you subscribe today to make sure you don't miss them. On the webpage for this double episode, we've got photos, sources and links to further reading. We've also got books and merchandise about the Spanish Civil War and reproduction posters available in our online store. Links to all that in the show notes. As we mentioned in part one, Nick and Catherine give Spanish Civil War history tours in Barcelona. So we asked Catherine to say a bit more about that. Nick Lloyd and I, Catherine Howley, have been running tours in the Spanish Civil War in Barcelona. Nick for over nine years and myself for almost five years with him. The tour itself takes you on a chronological journey from the beginning of the war and its effect on Barcelona through the revolutionary period, the anarchist revolution that the city witnessed, the complications of this revolution and the power struggle between the local anarchist forces here and the local governments. We then talk specifically about the historical memory of the war, 
the tour is conceived as a walking museum of the Spanish Civil War. And for the last few years, years we've been collecting original artefacts from the time period, which on two different stops in the tour, we sit down and discuss and you get to handle these artefacts. So if you are ever in Barcelona, we definitely recommend checking that out. Given the current global pandemic and lockdown, that's going to be pretty unlikely for the near future. But you can get hold of Nick's book, Forgotten Places, Barcelona and the Spanish Civil War. My book, Forgotten Places, which I wrote a few years ago, is partly a history book, and partly a guidebook. It's a history of the war from the point of view of Barcelona. The, the first third is, is tells a chronological history of, of the working class movements and social conditions, which leads us to understand what happened in July 1936, during the war, the bombing of the city, the social revolution, etc. And then the rest of the two thirds is a guide to the site. So it is, and that's often really is an excuse to tell stories in places. And this is what I like doing. So it's often taking places and using them as excuses to tell wider stories, which is what we like also doing on the tours. Nick is also on Twitter at civil underscore war underscore Spain. And with the lockdown, he started making informative YouTube videos. You can check them out at youtube.com slash user slash Barcelona Nick one. Links to all these in the show notes. This podcast was brought to you by our Patreon supporters. If you can, please consider supporting our work on Patreon from as little as $2 a month. Our supporters get access to exclusive content, bonus episodes, and other benefits. If you can't, no worries. Please just give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app, and share links to our episodes on social media. To all of our existing supporters, thank you so much. Without you, we simply could not make this podcast or do our research. The theme tune for these episodes is Alice Maricardas to the Barricades, provided courtesy of the CNT, who re-recorded the song recently for their Union Centenary. Thanks also to Louise Barry for editing these episodes, and thanks to all of you for listening. Catch you next time.